Hi, and welcome back to the Unconventionalist Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Roos, and this is a show about what it's really like to turn your message into a movement, where each week I get to sit down with disruptive and brave entrepreneurs and business leaders who dare to be different and do things their own way. Um, you've probably heard this saying before, the way that you spend your days is the way that you spend your life. And I am so honored and excited to bring to you this conversation, which was in part for the research of the book, but also I wanted to share this conversation with you um, around what it takes to fundamentally be more productive and to manage our attention so that we can finally focus on things that matters in our life. Um, it's a conversation that I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, one that was deeply uncomfortable to prepare for because it involved having to look at myself in the mirror. So you've probably heard of Nate Al in some way, shape or form. If you haven't, you've probably heard about his best-selling books, um, Hooked, How to Build uh, Habit-Performing Products, and of course, uh, Indistractable, which is the book that has been blowing my mind since I've read it, um, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. Nia is an author, a speaker, a consultant, an investor, uh, but more than that, he's a human, and we have a few things in common that I look forward to share with you uh, in the next few seconds. But first and foremost, a warm welcome, Nir, to the show. Thank you so much. Great to be here with you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So as I was going through like the research, looking a bit behind before we talk, we have a few things in common. Um, both our wives are called Julie. <laughs> uh, we're both dyslexic, which I, which I heard. Um, both struggle to write and, 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 and read out loud. Uh, both completely unexpected to end up writing a book. The only fundamental difference I really found is that my first book sold maybe a few hundred copies. Yours sold like millions. So that is <laughs> in essence as far as it goes. Oh, we also grew up in a household that spoke a different language than the school we went to, um, which uh, which I thought was something interesting. So yeah, first of all, yeah, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. I've got a lot we're of not, questions. We're not married to the same Julie, are we? No. <laughs> okay. Okay, I just want to make I sure. I don't think so. But one, okay. of, one, one of the reasons why I really wanted to... Um, dive into this is that a couple of things. So one of, first of all is I've heard you say this before, but you were, it was an accident that you ended up writing books. Like this wasn't meant to be the path, even though at one point you did consider journalism. Um, writing probably wasn't on your list of when you woke up, when you were like eight years old and said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And you said, I'm going to write books. Definitely not. Definitely not. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. That was my, <laughs> my dream as a kid. And, uh, then I got glasses, and so I knew that wouldn't be in, in my future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't get a private pilot's license, but I never went into the uh, into the Air Force. Okay, um, but and, and you know, this would probably be being an author would probably be the thing that I would be least likely to think I would I would end up doing. Uh, I got straight C's and D's in English yeah. <laughs> as an eight year old, yeah. uh, and so and as you mentioned, I I'm, I was diagnosed as dyslexic, and so I I never. I never read in my free time. That was never something that I enjoyed as a kid. Yeah, uh, It was only much later in life that I really fell in love, not even with reading books as much as persuasive essays. I really fell in love with persuasive essays. And um, uh, that's kind of what, what started my, my, my appreciation of, of, the, uh, of the medium. Yeah. And, and on that note, on persuasive essays, something that I, I talk about in, in my book is about this idea of, you know, origin stories and, and how, you know, superheroes have them and actually entrepreneurs and, and business leaders and compelling movement starters often have them. And I was kind of uh, looking into your backstory and kind of trying to shape it in my mind. And one of them that fell, and I don't know if this feels um, adequate to you, but one story I heard you share was how, you know, when you were in high school, so you grew up in, in central Florida um, which is a, a, apparently like a very uh, ultra conservative state, I guess, or part, or part of the US. And, um, you know, I've heard you talk about football being religion, basically. Um, you know, God, football, and everything else. Everything but, else, right. Yeah, but there was something I thought was really interesting is because your school didn't have enough teachers, they asked the football coach to teach this English class and you were in that English class. And the only thing you did was read Time Magazine. And, right. and the thing that you most looked forward to in Time Magazine was the open the kind of like the, the right? yeah that's it which at the end of the magazine which are letters and then you would debate now i have a theory and, and i don't know if this is theory is is accurate or not but it felt to me that at that point in time you were at a point where you feel like you didn't fit in necessarily you know you had a, a strange foreign name compared to the other kids in the school you spoke hebrew back at home you were dyslexic 
Um, I don't know if you played football or not. That's the that's the question. Definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> I was actually obese. I was clinically <laughs> obese as well. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Right. So you must be quite uncomfortable with skin. But it felt like those letters enabled you in some way to see that there's a way to change the way people think and come together. Would that be a, a, a fair assessment? Right. Yeah, very well put. Yeah, I would see people who, you know, we would read a, a an op-ed, uh, I don't know, about a very controversial topic, you know, abortion in the United States is a is a very, very hot topic. And sure. to see uh, an op-ed, you know, trying to make the case for one side or another and people who uh, were very conservative and would never see anything in the other way could be persuaded to to, to allow some some daylight uh, of, <laughs> of agreement between the two sides by by reading such an essay and, and talking about it. And I just thought that was an incredibly powerful medium to sit down and think about someone's argument that they, they took the time to make in, in the written form, I think is still probably one of the most mind blowing experiences. I, I love till this day, you know, some of my favorite essayists, uh, people like Paul Graham, I love his stuff. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. he, he really reading his book, hackers and painters really inspired me to just try, try the craft myself. But I remember reading his essays and going into it, thinking the world was one way. And then, yeah, by the end of the essay, and you know, a, a thousand words, you know, you can, uh, you, you can be transformed. Well, interestingly, this is, I think, I'm so glad you say that because it feels like your books do just that. Okay, it's not like a 1,000 word essay. It's, I don't know how many thousands of words this is. I'm going to guess like 50,000 or something. I don't know. Um, but it, it feels like that's that. Like when I, when I was reading the book, I was just thinking, oh, but that's like the eight-year-old near who sees how a, an argument can change the way people think. And your book changed the way that we relate to productivity and mm. a focus a, in, in a dramatic way. And I would almost say in an unexpected way, which for me was around therapy. Like there's, a, mm. there's almost like a, a deep psychological in, introspection around why we give away our attention to certain things and why we don't. And we'll get there in a second. Um, but your, your journey goes off, you, you know, you, you start thinking about going on a journalistic uh, career. And then I heard you say that you realized what the salaries were journalists <laughs> on a board that you saw. And you thought, we're going to try business. You go into consulting. That doesn't really work out. Um, you know, you get into business. It, it does well. I think, was it wind farm or solar energy or something? Solar energy, right. Solar energy, right. Yeah. You know, sell out. And then you go and do an MBA for a couple of years, um, come out. Then you go to Silicon Valley and, and start a business, which is, I think, is in social media advertising or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then you really you, did your homework here. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you're, and the, you're telling my story better than I could tell it myself. <laughs> no, but there, there's a reason to this. And then, and then this is where I think is, this is the moment, like, again, if you think about the story, origin stories and like the myth, the foundational myth of people and why they do what they do. For the first time, I think you had a real breathing moment where you had to ask yourself, what do I want to do next? What do I really want to do next? Like I've got, I've probably got a bit of cash. I've got some time. And you said, and I've heard you say this before. Um, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, it's um, consulting wasn't really your thing. You know, running mm -hmm. a business, being a CEO was actually really, really hard work. Um, why writing? Like how, like what, what I'm trying to think is how did you go from that eight-year-old looking in, you know, and how old were you, by the way, when you're reading the Time Magazine articles this in was, school? This uh, was ninth grade. Ninth grade. So what, how, because yeah. I, I had a that, different system in that's France. That's like uh, 12, 12, 13, 12. 13 okay, years cool. old. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and how old were you when you sold your business after the MBA and you were just before you started writing? Well, the first, we sold two companies. My wife yeah. and I started both companies together. So the first company we sold in 2008 and the second one we sold in 2012. Okay, okay. So it took a little while, right, for you to actually get to yourself to that question. What I'm curious about, how did, how did you go back to that initial interest of writing or of like yeah. discovering? Like, where did that come back? Yeah. So uh, I think good writing is good thinking. It's mm. really hard to write well if you can't think clearly. And it's an instrument that I use to get my thoughts in order. Mm. Uh, to, so so what, I, what I appreciated about uh, a great essay um, all the way from, back from, from ninth grade was how a well-structured essay um, makes a great argument, right? It, it mm -hmm. acknowledges the other side's point of view. Mm -hmm. And then it says, okay, but, but here are the faults in that argument. And here's what, what I believe, right? Yeah. <laughs> Based on, yeah. on these facts. Mm -hmm. And um, I 
Oh, I, I appreciate that structure. And I appreciated how that, that structure, that rigor of saying, okay, here's what is currently the case. Um, but there's some problems with that side of the story. And here's, here's what you should know. Right. Mm. And here's why th this is, I think a, a better perspective. Mm. And so I use that, you know, I, I kind of burned out in high school. I was very like politically involved and I, you know, I, I was into that. And, and then I, I kind of burned out on, 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 um, uh, political debate, uh, mm. but I, I utilize that same structure for right. life improvement, right? For other problems in my life. And so when I started, so I started writing again uh, after my second company was acquired uh, to answer a question for myself. I thought I was going to start another company and I really wanted to know, I, I had a very strong hypothesis that whatever I was going to start next had to have a habit built into it mm. uh, that that I knew that that's what I wanted to do next. It, you know, just looking at the writing on the wall, this was 2012, and the iPhone was only four years old, and I had a strong belief that the companies of the future would build habits, just because mm. we could see that the screen was shrinking. So as we went from desktop to laptop to mobile devices to wearable devices like the Apple Watch, the screen kept getting smaller and smaller. Today, mm -hmm. we have Amazon Alexa. The screen disappeared altogether with the interface. Mm. So that means that it, because we just have less real estate to trigger people with visual cues, habits become more important because there's just less area, surface area, to tell people what to do with visual messaging. So you have to trigger people on their own out of habit. Yeah. So that was my hypothesis. Uh, and I was trying to figure out how to allocate my human capital to what to work on next. And I thought I was going to start another company. And so I said, okay, I'm going to build a habit forming product. That has to be what I do next. How do you build habit forming products? And I looked around, I couldn't find a book that told me how to do that. <laughs> so, and meanwhile, I was looking at, at these companies that were so successful, you know, getting off the ground, like Google and Instagram and Facebook and Slack and Snapchat. And they all were masters of building yeah. habit. I want you to know, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, the fact that I could find a book on the topic, um, you know, the only way to scratch my own itch was to answer the question for myself. Yeah. So I started talking to my friends at these companies and kind of stealing their secrets and uh, talking to researchers at Stanford and spending a lot of time in the Stanford stacks, uh, you know, reading for, through consumer psychology work. And I wanted to codify this just for myself. Yeah. Of okay, here's here's the method. Here's how we use uh, habit forming technology for good, right? Not just for frivolity, not just for social media. I wasn't really interested in doing that anymore. I really wanted to figure out how do you use it to change people's lives, right? Yeah. What if we could exercise as habitually as we check Facebook? What if we could use uh, productivity apps to uh, help us learn more or connect with loved ones or do whatever we want to do mm -hmm. in the same way that we habituate to various uh, products with our phones? And so that's, that was what inspired me. Uh, but the fact that I didn't find anyone telling me how to do that no. meant I wanted to do it for myself. So I started blogging. That's what I did. I didn't set out to oh, write a book. Okay. I just started blogging about it. So I, I got a domain, nearandfar.com, near like my first name, so near and far. <laughs> and I just started writing about questions I had related to this space. And uh, I started getting some some subscribers, and then I kind of built a little audience, and one of the people in my audience was my old business school professor, Baba Shiv, who invited me to teach a class with him at Stanford. And so that turned into a speaking, uh, into a teaching gig. I was a lecturer in marketing there. And then later I moved over to the Hasselplatter Institute of Design at Stanford. And that's where I could kind of you know, teach this live, see if this methodology really works. I also was working with industry. And that's kind of what, what, what I did over those few years became my first book, Hooked. So that's it wasn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to write a book. It evolved organically. Yeah, it, it felt like it was like an organic, like a very organic kind of process. And I've heard you say this before, like some people write books to share what they know. You write books to like explore this question or this topic and, and so that you learn a bit more. Yeah. And many times, you know, it's, it's fits and starts, right? That many times uh, I'll say, oh, you know what? I really need to answer this question. That would make for a great book. Yeah. And then I do a little bit of research and I read a book on the topic and I say, well, no need to write that book. Somebody else has already written a great book on the topic. So I don't need to do that. <laughs> I would well, say- Nine out of 10 ideas uh, become that. <laughs> so that's a really interesting segue into a part of the element of the book that I'm trying to tackle myself, which is this idea of what has been coined as imposter syndrome in, in a kind of broad way. And I've interviewed Dr. Valerie Young, who wrote a great book about it. But um, it's this idea notion that who am I to talk about this, right? Like there are different ways that you could apply imposter syndrome to creators, authors, entrepreneurs. And one of them is this idea of like, a bit like you said, um, you read all these books and you think, why bother? Why should I write a book? What, what makes you 
know the difference between the voice that's telling you they're better than you, you're not good enough, like what have you got more to add with the, actually I may have a different spin on this. Should you tell yeah. like, I'm just wondering how do you work with that healthy balance of identifying yeah. the voice that is trying to be creative versus the voice that is trying to be more reactive. Does that make sense? Sure. So, so two things. One, uh, there are, okay. So I remember when I was in college, I took a class on jazz, jazz appreciation. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know anything about jazz. I never had listened to jazz my mm -hmm. entire life. Um, but it's, you know, it was a hole in my cultural knowledge. And so yeah. I wanted to fill that hole by knowing my dad's a jazz that. player. That's why I'm smiling. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're way ahead of the game. Um, <laughs> But I literally did not, I could not have named a musician uh, in that genre. Uh, and, and I took a wonderful class. The teacher was incredible. Mm. And one of the lessons that stuck with me was that jazz could have only begun in America because jazz was the melding of um, African elements of music mm. that, that the slaves brought with them mm -hmm. and European instruments. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was, you know, it was only that amalgamation of those two cultural contexts creating something new mm -hmm. and unique. And so whenever I write, I always, and I get that imposter syndrome and think, well, you know, is this, is this really unique? I always think, well, it's jazz, right? It's, it's blending maybe what's already known, but with my personal experience, with my mm. background. Uh, and so that, that kind of helps me get through, uh, that imposter syndrome of knowing like, Hey, I'm, I'm playing jazz here, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, 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 it's like maybe, it's, maybe I'm playing on the same instruments, but yeah. I'm playing it with a different history. Mm. And the, the second thing is that being said, <laughs> the other side of the story is also, you don't want to regurgitate stuff that's already been said. Mm. So mm -hmm. you know, a lot of books, especially in my genre around business books and yeah. uh, self-help, they really are regurgitation of. You know, I've, if I hear about the marshmallow study one more time, I'm going to scream, right? How many times do we hear the same stuff again and again and again? It's nauseating. Yeah, and it's, yeah. and it's, I think it's a sign of not doing your homework. Yeah. So on one hand, yes, you know, do, do, you, know you are original. Just the fact that you're reinterpreting something makes it unique. On the other hand, do your homework and make sure you're not saying it's, you know, almost verbatim, <laughs> right? Like Add something. You know, so, so my test is if I read something hmm. that actually solves my problem. So I write when I have a problem that sure. I'm looking to solve. And 99% of my problems I figure out because somebody else also had that problem and they wrote a book about it. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I read someone else's work and I apply it and it works, well, then I don't write the book. Mm. But if I read it and it doesn't work, mm. now I got something. Yeah. And that's what happened with Indistractable. So with Hooked, I didn't find a book on the topic. There was literally no book about how to build habit-forming products. With Indistractable, there were lots of books about yeah. distraction. Yeah. And I read every one I could get my hands on. It was a lot of work, <laughs> a yeah. lot of work. And I'll tell you that the, the, the techniques that I found in this book, these other books did not work. The, the general advice was distraction is caused by technology. Yeah. Yeah. It's hijacking your brain. You're getting addicted. It's the big bad tech companies doing it to you. You're a victim. Yes. So, to, Blame, you know, so, so don't take responsibility. Blame it. Exactly. On yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I would agree with some of that, that yeah. it is not your fault, right? You didn't invent Facebook. You didn't invent the iPhone. You didn't invent these things. It's not your fault. Yeah. But it is your responsibility. Mm. So there's a difference there, right? Yeah. One is saying it's their fault and their responsibility, which mm -hmm. is ridiculous because they're not going to, you know, the New York Times is never going to say to you, hey, stop checking the news so much, right? Go be with your kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> like that's never going to happen. So it's our responsibility. And, and, and so it was only after I read those other, you know, people, the, 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 the topic experts, and I said, these solutions are stupid, right? Yeah. Like there's a bunch of professors telling people to throw away their, their iPhones. Well, thanks. You have tenure. <laughs> you yeah. know, like it's not very useful to the yeah. average person who communicates to their, you know, to their employer with mm -hmm. their phones. We need something better. It didn't work for me. And I don't think it works for most people. And so that's why I wanted to dive into this, you know, into the five years that took me to write Indistractable. And, and I think came up with an answer that, you know, completely changed my life. I've, I've never been in better physical shape uh, because I work out, you yeah. know, as opposed to before I would say I was going to work out, but I didn't. Yeah. I've never been more productive. I've never had a better relationship with my family, all because I simply follow through. I do what I say I'm going to do. Yeah. And I use a lot of technology to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't have to give it up. Yeah. There's... Yeah, there's a lot in what you're saying, which, which I want to unpack. One of them is, I think that is a narrative that I've heard in different ways about, 
And it's true. And I, I actually, I had the narrative a lot when I used to go into companies and talk about how to better lead and, and engage millennials. And I would try and give them a context as to around how technology has impacted the way that we interact and build relationships and so forth. But one thing I, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the show, and, you know, again, I keep on saying it was a very uncomfortable read at times because, mm. you know, I heard you say, you know, a mistake repeated more than once is a decision. And I was like, oh, ow, that's, yeah. <laughs> that, that's- I, I can't take credit for that. that that's not me. That's Poelo Coelho. Uh, who oh, okay. There you go. The okay. Yeah. 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 It, it, yeah it, it hit you as hard as it hit me when I read that. I said, yeah, oh, right. God, that's good. <laughs> well, well, yeah, because that's what I mean. So, so I've, I'd heard before someone talk about like productivity isn't about being uh, an intellectual process. It's about emotional, but you went like a, a step further. I felt like your, your take on it was that basically time management is, is pain management. Right. And I think that's where the therapy, the, the therapy kind of element and all this deep psychology element came into for me when I was going over the book, which was actually what you, you, you were explaining around this noise, these external triggers that you're basically blaming everything on. It's like 10% of the problem. That's right. 90% that's of the problem. It. Yeah. Right. And and that, and that's not a made up number. That is an actual number that we know from studies that, that studies find that 90% of the time that people check their phones. They check them because of internal triggers, not external triggers. External triggers, just to fill in everyone in, these are the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in your outside environment that prompts you to action. It does cause distractions about 10% of the time. But that the other 90% mean. is what's going on inside of right. you. Right. And this is why the conventional advice around, you know, it's Facebook's fault, stop using your iPhone, it's technology addicting you is dumb. Because we've always struggled with distraction and we always will struggle with yeah. distraction. Plato, the Greek philosopher, was talking about distraction 2,500 years ago. Yeah. Because most distraction begins from within. Yeah. It's our desire to escape discomfort, these internal triggers, boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, stress, anxiety. This is why we look for escape, whether it's too much news, too much booze, too much football, too much Facebook. Mm -hmm. We're going to look for distraction if we don't know how to deal with those internal triggers. Yeah. You said, you know, the only way to handle distraction is to learn how to handle pain. That's you right. Know, Time you know, management is pain management. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, you know, this, so I don't know if you, you do you mind sharing the story of the metaphor or the analogy of the, the Q tape, you know, the, the, the um, uh, what do you call it? A Bayard uh, pool table. You know about the, yeah. the proxy versus because that is still like every time I talk about your book and I've recommended it to like everyone I can grab their ears. But I'll say like I use this story of like this is what blew my mind, like the core versus proxy triggers. Yeah. Would you mind just sharing sure. that? Because I think people would really benefit from that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, it's it's uh, the, the best way to understand what's the what's the real cause of the problem. Uh, is to look for the root cause rather than what we call the proximal cause. So mm. a good metaphor for this is if you think about you know the game of pool, mm -hmm. uh, you can substitute a any game where a club hits a ball, right? <laughs> but uh, tennis or uh, or golf or whatever you mm -hmm. want. Take pool for example. So if I asked you what makes the ball move, right? Why mm -hmm. why does the ball go towards uh, uh, the, the the pocket on the pool table? You'll say, well, it's the cue, right? The cue hits. The stick hits the ball and the ball goes towards the pocket. But let's say we removed the stick. Mm. Would it, the ball still go into the pocket? Well, it depends. It depends on mm. whether the person reaches for another stick or picks the ball up and puts it in the pocket, <laughs> right? Yeah. The root cause of yeah. why the ball goes in the pocket is not the stick. Yeah. That's the proximal cause. That's the tool. Mm. The root cause is the player, the motivation of mm. the player to put the ball where he wants it to go. So when we blame technology for our distraction mm -hmm. or whatever, by the way, every generation, every generation says, oh, the world is more distracting than ever, right? My generation, oh, the television, your couch potatoes, you're all, be, you know, yeah. that's distracting. And before them, uh, it was rock and roll music and the radio, the bicycle, literally all these technologies people blame for melting their brains and addicting them, like literally ver mm. verbatim to what people complain about today around technology. And of course, every time we blame the proximal cause, we never blame the root cause. Mm. The root cause is us. Mm. It's us. Now, again, that doesn't mean it's your fault. But it does mean it's your responsibility. So if we play the victim and we say, oh, uh, you know, the, 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 these wonderful things that we get to use, uh, they're, they're addicting us. Please, government, fix it. Uh, mm. Please, companies, fix it. If you hold your breath, you're going to suffocate. Mm. 
Mm. So I'm not saying that there isn't room for legislation. I'm not saying that I'm 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 glad that people are mm. uh, you know raising awareness about the fact that you know we we are paying a price when our attention is diverted. Mm -hmm. But I think the conclusion is wrong. The conclusion that most people in this field will tell you, uh, not not the academics, but the the lay people will tell you it's it's technology's fault. Stop using technology. And I say maybe, but mm -hmm. what can you do about it today? Yeah. Right, because if it's not this, it's something else. We're always distracted by one thing or another, unless we understand the root cause of the problem. And the root cause of the problem is our internal triggers. We have to face that first. If we don't master our internal triggers, they become our master. Love that. And let's get let's get like a granular example. So I've applied what I've kind of read in your book in different settings. Right. One of them, for example, is uh, I kept on having this um, habit habit forming bad habit forming you know like of life but it was i would i would at night every single time when we'd connect with julie and we'd have a tea or we'd watch a movie whatever it was i'd go and snack i'd go and grab like this mountain of biscuits or chocolates or whatever right and as i was exploring your book and your concept i was thinking okay if the biscuit and the and tell me correct me if i'm wrong by the way but if the if the chocolate and the biscuit is the external um, trigger point or whatever it is, then what's the internal, what is it that I'm actually trying to run away from? Because I think yeah. that's a, like a big question that kept on coming back to is what am I avoiding? What's the pain that I don't want to be with? So is it that I'm stressed because I'm in the middle of writing my book? Is it because I, I, um, I'm anxious about something? Is it because I don't feel secure about whatever it is? And just that awareness enabled me. It was really weird. It really weird. Like, Oh, well, maybe I'm going to grab a, a pear. But it wasn't because the chocolate was bad and the pear was good, right? Like, as you talk about this, you talk about, like, actually, the, 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 the problem we most do is that when we commit to something we don't, we beat ourselves up. But actually, that's, like, yeah. a really negative cycle. Right. But in that example of chocolate and, and, you know, trying to understand what is the benefit of people who know they're engaging in behaviors that aren't helping them become the person they want to be or live the life that they desire? They're aware of their behavior, fill in the blank. What's a, what's a tip you have for them about how they can have an introspective observation of what that internal trigger might be? Yeah. Yeah. So this is super important. I mean, the, you know, this is struggle, something I've struggled with my entire life. So as I mentioned, I used to be clinically obese mm. and I still from time to time struggle with Oh, that midnight snack, <laughs> right? That, uh, not, you know, it can be boredom. It can be mm. uh, stress. It can mm. be anxiety. Most often, it's fighting the urge mm. to have something yummy, right? Like just mm. the, the fact that I want something and I know I shouldn't mm -hmm. is yeah. itself very psychologically destabilizing, mm. which is why abstinence is not the answer. Mm. That this is, you know, a lot of what I do, by the way, is is turning over apple carts. I mean, that's a kind of, it's again, it's, it, we, we all know the argument of just say no. Yeah. Well, just say no doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. We saw how well the just say no campaign yeah. worked for the, the drug war. It doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Why doesn't it work? Because telling yourself not to do something is like pulling on a rubber band. Mm -hmm. You can only pull so far before you pull, 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 and then you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. And when the rubber band is let go, it doesn't just go where it started. No, it ricochets across the room. Mm. So this is why many times this is this is actually what we're discovering makes cigarettes so addictive. It's actually not the nicotine we're okay. discovering. It's the fact that people tell themselves, "Don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke." Don't smoke. Okay, fine, I'll smoke. And that relief of telling themselves that they can do something that previously said they could not yeah. is why they think smoking is relaxing. When you ask right. smokers why yeah. do they smoke, they say, "Oh, it's so relaxing." Nicotine is a stimulant. Yeah. Makes no sense to say that smoking is relaxing. It's not. What you're doing when you smoke is that you take nice deep breaths and you can finally give in to the thing you wanted. It's the same thing with the chocolates at night. Mm. It's probably, you know, if you've had dinner, you're probably not physically hungry. Mm. What you crave is to relieve yourself of the tension and uh, uh, discomfort yeah. of telling yourself not to do something. There was something, and I've got it in my notes somewhere. I can't seem to, to get it, but it's um, you had this. You said this thing that was so like something. Like I'm going to paraphrase this, so please correct me. It's something like we we engage in these habits to relieve a pain we know or are familiar with, you know, because the 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 actual feeling we get from, and I think that's what you kind of point into, 
is one of the reasons why we engage in this habit in the first place. Right. And that's why we go down this vicious cycle of telling ourselves not to do something. We finally give in and do it. And we are essentially reinforcing the very behavior we're trying to not do. Yeah. Which is why abstinence tends not to work. Now, yeah. in some circumstances, abstinence is a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. If you can remove your, like, for example, drug addiction, you know, when people get new friends, so they don't have to see those external triggers that yeah. prompted them to, to do drugs, that can be a, a healthy step. Yeah. But when it comes to things you cannot escape, okay, food, you got to eat, right? Yeah. Technology, these, yeah. th I mean, you can't escape technology. So telling people to abstain is not very good advice. Okay. So what do you do instead? Yeah. What you have to do is to learn how to master these internal triggers. And there's over a dozen different things you can do. My goal is not to say, oh, it's only this thing. You know, a lot of people out there say, oh, it's meditation is the answer yeah. or, you know, whatever, mindfulness. There, there is no one answer. There are tools in your toolkit that you can take out and use for the right time and place. One of my favorite tools comes from acceptance and commitment therapy. And this is called the 10 minute, minute rule. rule. The 10 yeah. minute rule says that you can give in to any temptation. You want those chocolates at night? You can have them. You wanna smoke the cigarette? Fine. You wanna check email when you mm. should be working on that big project instead? No problem. You're not gonna tell yourself no. You're gonna tell yourself not yet. Okay, mm. not no, not yet. So what mm -hmm. you do is you take out a timer, right? I'll take out my phone. I'll say set a timer for 10 minutes. I'll put my phone down. And now I can give into that distraction in 10 minutes. Mm. And so all I have to do, I can, I can, I, I, there's a fork in the road. Either I can get back to the task at hand, whatever it is I said I was going to do with my time, or I can do what's called surf the urge. And I show you exactly how to do this. A, little, a few mm. more steps that you need to know. Mm. But essentially what you're doing is you're stopping and you're bringing awareness to what is that uncomfortable state you're feeling. Mm. And you're just sitting with it for a few minutes. And what we don't realize in the moment is that these emotions are like waves right? Mm -hmm. The urge, the itch, the sensation, the craving crests and then subsides. So if we can just ride it out, if we can ride yeah. it like a surfer on a surfboard, by the time those 10 minutes are up, 90% of the time, you won't have that urge anymore, Yeah. right? And then of course, the 10 minute rule grows into the 12 minute rule and the 15 minute rule and the 20 minute rule. And what you're doing is that you're proving to yourself, you're showing yourself that you have the agency, the self-efficacy to not give in, mm. as opposed to before, it, it was an impulse, it was a habit, it was something done with little or no conscious thought. Now you can say, wait a minute, do I really want that? Let mm. me wait 10 minutes. If I still want it in 10 minutes, I'll have it. And so what you're doing is building that agency over time. And again, this is just one of many techniques. No, no, I, I love it. And, and I think one of the things that I took away as well from your book and, 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 and hearing, hearing you talk about this topic is um, the importance of self-compassion, which right. again, I, I, you know, it's, that's why I think it's a really interesting take on the topic because you bring in a lot of not to say eastern philosophies but just more compassionate uh, approach to to kind of productivity and focus and time management and attention seeking and and i want to talk about this because i think a lot of people will relate to this in the sense that so okay so I, me included by the way so you know we read your book we get the kind of the concept the toolkits we start going on this journey we're starting to get a bit of traction on some things and then we might fall short we slip or whatever and yeah. I know for me, it's so easy for me to beat myself up and go back to that old story of, you know, the, you know, the Brené Brown definition of shame and guilt, yeah. you know, guilt is yeah. I did something you bad, shame bad, is I am bad. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so then begins the, 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 the kind of the, the negative self-talk around, well, I'm never going to be able to do this. Like there's yeah. just something fundamentally wrong with me. Even, you know, says about all these great techniques. It doesn't apply. What have you found in your research and your own personal uh, experience that has been helpful to lean in and remind yourself of the importance of self-compassion. Yeah, it's a great point. I'm so glad you brought this up because, you know, for a while, uh, I was very frustrated uh, mm. with myself and with some of my readers. You know, I do weekly office hours every week on Wednesday. Uh, people call me, they book time with me in 15-minute increments. And if you've read one of my books and you have a question, you can ask me whatever you want. Mm. And... Um, I, I would get a lot of amazing people with incredible stories telling me how the books worked and how they improved their lives. Most of the people who called did that. I would say probably 80%. Mm -hmm. But then every once in a while, I'd get a call of somebody who said, you know, I'm still struggling with distraction. I read your book. It didn't work. Mm. And I would get really frustrated with this. And I'm, okay, well, well, tell me what you did. You know, did you use uh, the, the techniques I talk about? Did you master your internal triggers? Did you make time for traction? Did you hack back external triggers? Did you prevent distraction with packs? right? We, what mm. did you do from the book? Mm. I, I, did, I didn't do anything. <laughs> so to me, my first gut reaction was, I spent five years of my life giving you the answer to your problem on a silver platter. All you got to do is do it. Yeah. 
And uh, it was very frustrating. Mm. But what I found over time is that the people who implemented the techniques in the book mm -hmm. and changed their lives and really became high performers and really you know, live their life now with in integrity, you know, they, they really do as they say they're going to do, they are indistractable. It's not that those people failed more. It's that they were more self-compassionate. Mm. So the people who failed and didn't get back on the horse, the people who didn't keep trying, they didn't fail more often. They just gave up altogether. Mm -hmm. So the number one reason we don't achieve our goals, what's the number one reason people don't achieve their goals? At the end of the day, it's because they quit. Mm -hmm. It's persistence. They quit. Mm -hmm. And why do people quit? It's because they make up some cockamamie story about how somehow they're broken. Mm -hmm. They're not broken. They just didn't give themselves the so self-compassion to allow themselves to persist mm -hmm. because they think there's something fundamentally wrong with them. And to be imperfect. There's, right. There's also right. Like, like, so, yeah. so the people who persist, they realize that failure is part of the process. I still get distracted from time to time, right? Mm -hmm. And I came up with the word indistractable. Well, how does that work? <laughs> well, when you make up a term, you get to define it any way you want. <laughs> so being indistractable yeah. doesn't mean you never get distracted. Being bulletproof. indistractable yeah. means you strive to do what you say you're going to do. So an indistractable person knows why they got distracted mm -hmm. and they do something about it. Mm -hmm. A distractible person keeps getting distracted by the same thing again and again and again, mm -hmm. and they do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. So they've chosen to be distractible, just like mm -hmm. that Poelo Coelho quote, a mistake yeah. repeated more than once is a decision. Mm -hmm. So if it's the same things again and again and again, how many times are we going to complain about Facebook? How many times are we going to mm -hmm. complain about these distractions before we do something about it? So an indistractable person says, okay, you got me once, twice, but you're not going to get me again. I'm going to do something about it so that it doesn't keep happening. Yeah. So one of the ways that, that we find is a characteristic of people who do stay on the horse and you know get back on and keep riding forward is that they offer themselves self-compassion. How do you do that? You want to talk to yourself the way you would talk to a good friend. So when you make a mistake, when you get distracted, when you go off track, when you maybe didn't live up to your values or didn't do what you say you're going to do, okay, how would my best friend talk to me in this occasion? Would they berate me? Would they say I'm a horrible human being? Not if they were my good friend. And yet that's exactly the kind of dialogue mm -hmm. that many of us have with ourselves. We talk to sure. ourselves like bullies. Sure. And that's not helpful. 100%. And there's, there's, a, there's a line or a sentence I heard you say, which, um, which I, actually I, I've used and I thought was really helpful is, and I'm going to paraphrase it again, so you have to apologize. Uh, pardon, no problem. You know, I sometimes mm -hmm. it makes things up, but something like remind ourselves that this is part of the journey of growing or this is part of right. the journey of of of, of learning of getting better yeah that's right, right right that the struggle you know many many part of my beef right now with uh the habits uh kind of the, the zeitgeist i think you know we're in this like peak habits period everybody wants to make everything into a habit right mm. how many books about habits are there right now mm. including mine and part of what i think is is not well understood about habits is that habits have a very specific definition. The definition of a habit is the impulse to do a behavior with little or no conscious thought. Mm -hmm. But most people, when they say they want to start a habit, what they're really saying is they want to have done something they don't really like doing, right? Mm -hmm. I want to start a writing habit. Yes. I don't really want to write. Yeah. I want to I want have book. written. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to start an exercise habit. I don't actually like exercising, but oh, I wish yes. I had the habit <laughs> so that I will have exercised and not have suffered yeah, 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 <laughs> right? yeah. doing the exercise. 100%. But that's antithetical to what it means to, to have a habit, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Habits are, by definition, things done with little or no conscious thought. How do you write with little or no conscious thought? I don't know. I don't know how to write. <laughs> you, you, to write, you have to think. <laughs> how yeah. do you exercise? Uh, without effort. I mean, if you want to get stronger, if you want to get better, okay, if you want to take a walk, that can be done out of habit. If it's effortless, sure. But if you want to grow your muscles, if you want to lose weight, if you're on a diet, if you want to get faster, if you want to excel at your job, if you want to do hard work that other people aren't willing to do, that's not a habit. Meditation, not a habit. Because mm. if you're meditating habitually, you're asleep. <laughs> meditation requires effort yeah. <laughs> so the problem like that. is that people don't That's realize that by saying they want to form a habit they're actually sabotaging themselves why mm -hmm. because after you know they they do what they think is a habit for 20 30 days whatever mm -hmm. and they realize it's still hard it's still difficult yeah. 
And they say, well, I must be broken. There must yeah. be something wrong with me. This is supposed to be effortless. Well, no, you just picked the wrong behavior. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the technique. It's that you applied the wrong. It's not you that's broken. It's that you have a broken technique here. Yeah. So the, the idea here is, is, is that some behaviors are habits. Some mm -hmm. behaviors are routines. And for those routines, we need to expect them to be difficult. Mm. To show and up. that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. So when we deal with the internal triggers, as opposed to trying to escape them with distraction, mm -hmm. we can leverage those internal triggers. We can leverage those uncomfortable emotional states like rocket fuel to propel us towards traction mm -hmm. because we know how to deal with them. Yeah. I love it. Oh, there's so many, and I'm conscious of time to be really respectful. And I've got so many more questions I would have loved to ask you for another time for a, no a, another place. Well, um, the few specific questions I really want to ask and make sure I got in sure. is that in your in, and you're an amazing storyteller like you share all these stories and you've got all these different anecdotes and and in particular like you share intimate stories of you and your wife and and you intimate <laughs> like no but in this you know and I, and, I, and I've, i want to acknowledge you for that because uh first of all there's a quick anecdote where my um partner signed me up for a stand-up comedy course for a charity night it's a long story we won't get into it the bottom line is i shot myself it was terrible um, and the night before, I was supposed to go and do this five-minute live stand-up comedy gig in one of London's kind of really notorious comedy clubs in front of 100 people. She said to me, you better have not included any jokes about our intimate life or about me and your set. My whole set was just that. We just had a baby, you know. I mean, what else is going to talk about, right? Like, <laughs> I'm not fine. I'll, I can change the video. But, but the point was... When I was, and I know you acknowledged her at the end of the book, you know, you actually did do a beautiful acknowledgement to, to, to Judy around, you know, having like almost like <laughs> allowed you to share some of the stories, but yeah. was that process for you always easy to share a story about your personal life, your intimate life in a business professional public setting? If not, yeah. I'd love to hear what, what helped. Well, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, I write books for problems I have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so this is the, just to fill everyone else in because we're kind of, uh, uh, everybody's wondering, what's the topic? What's the day? It's, it's about our sex life. Yeah. <laughs> my, my wife and I have been married for 20 years now. Yeah. And uh, there was a period of time when, you know, we would go to bed and, and we would uh, caress our iPhones and fondle our iPads and we weren't being, we were, weren't intimate with each other and we didn't have quality time with each other. Mm. And so we wanted to figure out how to solve that problem. And so that's what I talk about in the book mm. is how to have indistractable relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, God bless her. She was she was great. You know, I wrote up this article. And before I pub hit published, I, I definitely shared it with her. Smart man. <laughs> and, and she was she was OK with it. And uh, yeah, and I, I think it's, it's interesting because that's one of the chapters of the book that um, it's one of those kind of taboo subjects. Yeah. Right. Nobody really wants to talk about. But everyone um, experiences it. Everybody. Everybody experiences. Exactly. Yeah. But, but, so, and just, just, just to dive in the question, the last bit, which is, was it always comfortable for you to talk about yourself or your personal stories or your intimate stories in a public setting? Because was that the first time you, you shared about yourself in a public setting, which I don't think it was? Um, because people, the reason why I'm asking this is that mm. the book I'm writing is for a lot of people, they find that really hard. Like they decide, mm. I want to have my, I don't want my private life to be a public. That's one thing. But the other one is just like, and I'm going to be mixing two things here, but there's this idea of how is my story going to help land the message I'm trying to land or, or, or help yeah. me advance my cause for my business. That's one. And the second one is, is um, the fear of emotional exposure that comes yeah. with that. But I know from a fact from speaking to you, read, reading your book, speaking to over 300 people now over the years, that when people open up about real stuff, like things like that, that you said that are taboo, but we all live through, what you find isn't, fear or rejection it's actually connection yeah and, and i've just yeah. wondered when you do you remember that first time you experienced that or a level of that so my default state is to interpret uh and condense academic studies that are super boring uh into actionable insights i think yeah. i think that's that's what that would be my default state is yeah. you know arm's length here's what this study said and here's how you can implement it into your life go and be well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, you know, part of the reason that, you know, on the cover of the book, Julie's name is on the cover of the book along with mine is that many times she would tell me this is hella boring. <laughs> like, <laughs> you you got to inject some human interest here. Like this is, this is dull. Yeah. And I think my natural inclination was like, yeah, but that, these are the facts. Like, this is what the studies yes. say. And that should be um, enough. That just, like if I that provide enough. the stats, exactly. like, surely I, that should I, be, yeah. Exactly. I've told people the truth. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> like, and uh, the fact is like, 
it, it doesn't stick. Mm. Like without story, it just doesn't stick, right? Like people mention, you know, what you did. That, that's the, the chapter in the book where I talk about my sex life or they talk about, you know, the, 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 the struggles I had with my yeah. daughter. Like yeah. they'll mention anecdotes. Almost nobody mentions a specific study <laughs> no. that I cited. Yeah. Because they're not, they're not memorable, even though they're yeah. amazing. Like the studies yeah. are, are really interesting, yeah. uh, but they're not, they're not sticky in the same way a story is. So I think it's for two reasons. Number one, it's for that, the, the, the memorability of the lesson I'm trying to impart. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think there's something around the need for credibility with my reader that this isn't only peer reviewed studies like that's the kind of book i most appreciate i want to make a product that i would consume myself mm -hmm. uh and and I, I am the reader in many ways right i am trying to find the answer to solve my own problem True. so to me like i think a lot of nonfiction books they a lot of them are one extreme or the other either mm -hmm. you get a hundred percent anecdote like you know the secret right like no mm -hmm. science just a hundred percent anecdote i hate those books because mm -hmm. You know, like I, I, they lack credibility, yeah, yeah, right? I, I want to see the peer reviewed I study. It. I get it. But then there's the other extreme, like the books written by academics that are just, like just studies. Right. And that's really boring. To, mm. So I think it's the right mix of not only is this backed by good research, I applied this to my life, or here's maybe a case study. You know, sometimes it's not something I've used, just, you know, I'm not in that specific context. So yeah. I cite someone I know who's used this technique mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, uh, as an anecdote, but ha weaving in story, I think is, is incredibly important. Yeah, no, it massively is. And I love, I love the way that you, you put that because it's so true. And it's true. A lot of the stories that you talk about, like the game that you were with your daughter, the, the dollar bill you put on your cupboard, like all these anecdotes yeah. and stories. <laughs> is what I, yeah, but it's true, but you do, you remember. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the final points I want to make as well is um, I often say that no impact is an island. And as I was going through the book and looking at both the acknowledgments, but also the, the praises for the book, it's like, it's amazing. It feels like over the five years that you wrote this book, you've accumulated like this huge team, right? Like mm. the better readers, the, and, you know, and we're also talking like you're getting help from people like Adam Grant and James Clear and, um, uh, um, Aaron having to like, this, and the list goes on and on and on. How, how would you recommend anybody who's thinking about putting a book out there or getting a project out there? How important is it to kind of get that community, making it almost like an, a shared experience as opposed to kind of what mm. I've stupidly done, stuck <laughs> into my, you know, time box, my, my life and just kind of stayed in my, in my den and just write the book for like three months nonstop. Um, I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, the best thing I did in the entire book writing process was involve my readers. Mm. So with both books, I had what I called a contributor program. And I, mm. I never saw anyone else do this. I just thought it was the right thing to do. Mm. Um, I had a blog subscriber list of about 5,000 people when I, mm. when I mm. was finished with the first draft of Hooked. And I sent out an email and said, hey, I just finished writing my uh, a first draft of this thing. Would anybody like to to read it and give me some pointers before I send it, you know, before I publish, I self-published hooked. Mm. Uh, and so before I self-publish it, like, do you want to, anybody want to read it? And out of those 5,000 readers, I had like 500 that said, yeah, I'd love to read it. Well, I didn't expect 500 readers. So I, I had to like take the, take the, 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 the word doc and put yeah. it into a Google doc yeah. and then like yeah. have five Google docs. Cause it only had a limit of a hundred people yeah. at a time. And I was absolutely amazed because you know, when you traditionally publish a book, you have an editor, like one editor mm. at the publishing house who basically looks through it and tells you what they like, what they don't like. Well, that's, you know, the author's opinion versus the editor's opinion. If sure. I don't agree, well, I'm the author. I'm going to stick to it. Yeah. But when you have 30 people all saying, hey, this part doesn't make any sense or this research is not very good or you need to rewrite this, well, then you can't argue <laughs> anymore. Yeah, right. So the book got 100% better. Uh, mm. because I invited people to help me edit the book. Now, the bargain was, if you help me edit the book, I will put your name in the yeah. back. So there's about four pages of names at the very back that. of the book. I thought that was yeah. so cool. And, and it was the least I could do. I was so thankful yeah. that these folks put in the time and effort to do it. Yeah, so there's you know page after page. I, mean, yeah. I think it's only like four pages, but yeah. of people who, who helped contribute to the book. The interesting part was that when the book was actually published, guess who were the most fervent advocates for the book? Of course. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Early conference. The folks who helped work on it. 100%. So uh, it with so my second sense. book, yeah, with my, I did the same thing with the second book and it, it worked just as well. It was incredibly, incredibly helpful to get their feedback. And that, I just want to acknowledge you for that because I think it also takes a credible humility and courage to put your work out there 
knowing that it's not finished and perfect for the world to see and, and comment. Because, I, you know, someone who's gone, just gone through the process, it can feel incredibly daunting. You know, like even my publisher's like, oh, can you send me like a few chats? I'm like, hell no. Would you ask like <laughs> an artist to send you a, 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 a photo of like the sculpture they're doing? for Like, I've just yeah. been so like this. And I think yeah. the more I speak to authors like you and, and, and read books about it, it feels like I completely did it the wrong way which is fine and I'm learning and, you know, for the next book and all this stuff. But, um, you know, as, as I wrap up our conversation today, uh, you know, and I, before I ask you my last question. By the way, one, one rule of thumb, just to to elaborate on that point real quick is that if you're not embarrassed when you share your work, you share too late. Mm. You're supposed to be embarrassed when you share your work. That's a good sign. 100%. Oh yeah. Yeah, Just, (laughs) uh, just, I'm getting like all sorts because I'm coming to the end of my vomit draft. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, I've, again, so I want to, you know, I want to praise and acknowledge you um, for putting this work out there and for really taking the time. And, I lo- and it makes sense now that you're saying that you read all these different books and realized that what was missing was this. And you, you know, put a lot of attention. It makes sense now that why the book is so good, because you had so many different inputs. And, and, and really what I'm hearing is that you care. And, and thank you for that, because this book has been thank really you. helpful. I've recommended to a bunch of people who've been really excited about it. Um, and anybody listening or watching this, make sure to go and check it out and distractable. Um, it's available on any, any kind of good bookstore. Uh, you also have a program, uh, I think it's on mindvalue.com or something like that and your website, and we'll plug all that into the show notes. Um, and there's two final questions I want to ask you. Sure. Number one, uh, I asked this to all my guests. Um, and that is what does being unconventional mean to you? Being unconventional means, um, allowing yourself to be a contrarian that uh if you if you see the truth even if it's an unpopular truth that uh you're not afraid to say it mm. love it and uh, if you write a book every five years which it feels like i don't, I don't know if you're going to keep that pattern or not but it feels like it's a kind of a um are you already working on the next book without having to divulge on it like are you already kind of working on the next project if not what's next not, not quite. I'm, I still feel like I have a lot to do in terms of uh, helping the world become indistractable. Yeah. So thank you for helping us spread the message. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly focused on that. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, I, I write books based on problems I have. So I have lots of problems. So I yeah. have lots of potential material. So uh, the problem isn't uh, not knowing what to write. It's about filtering down to something I really want to write about. Yeah. <laughs> so the process involves, you know, every time I have a, a problem, it's okay, well, let me read other people's work on it and yeah. see if it works. And again, 99% of the time, somebody's done great work already. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm still searching for that problem that uh, I need solved, but yeah. haven't quite found the solution to. L- love it. And if people want to connect with you or sign up to your blog and, and read out what's the best website that they can go and check you out. Yeah. So if they go to nearandfar.com, that's my blog. And if they go to indistractable.com, there's actually a complimentary 80 page workbook there. Mm-hmm. And that's at indistractable spelled I N the word distract a B L E. So indistractable.com. Amazing. Nir, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor. And uh, I very much look forward to uh, sharing this conversation with the world. And uh, please let me know if there's anything I can do to help you on your journey too. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. And good luck with your book. Likewise, happy to help. Yeah, thanks. There you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed my conversation as much as I did. I'm really grateful that Nir took the time um, out of his uh, highly committed schedule to not being distracted on things that matter. So I don't take it for granted. Um, but it's a really uh, valuable and interesting conversation that needs to happen around demystifying the process of productivity and attention and, and focus and that actually there is an emotional element to it um, and, and managing pain isn't that easy. So if you'd like to get help and support and find out more about it, uh, make sure to go to indistractable.com and buy a copy uh, of the book and support Nair's work. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did for sure. And I'm excited to share these conversations with you, these behind the scenes conversations as I research and um, grow this crazy project of mine uh, of a book. But I really appreciate all the comments and feedback and support. If you'd like to join the community of of people helping shape the book, it's www.marklarus.com forward slash newsletter. And uh, and I've been amazed by all the support and feedback from people so far on suggestions and resources and sharing their stories uh, with me. And I'm, and I'm humbled by it also. So thank you. Until next time, remember, um, keep that fire burning and you matter. Never forget that. I'll see you next time.